So yeah, as I've said, Kursk. Yeah. Biggest tank battle that ever there was. Yeah, you couldn't resist jumping in on this one. Oh, got to. <laughs> Jim, welcome. Yes, welcome sir. back to welcome back on, man. Uh, so uh, the Battle of Kursk, it's the largest tank battle that, uh, that has ever been in the world, yeah? Okay, so um, here we go. Uh, we have arrived at, depending on how you measure it, uh, the very top of the mountain when it comes to historical wargaming. Yeah. Um, Star Wars has the Battle of Endor. Fantasy has uh, the Battle of Pelennor Fields. We're at the 70th anniversary now of the Battle of Kursk. Yeah. Uh, you're close, War. You're still at that silver level of, of the Grognard. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Kursk is, historians pretty much consider, uh, the largest battle that has ever taken place in the sweep of human history, wow. period. Oh. Uh, tanks or otherwise. Yeah. Um, if you include the full scope of the battle, which most histories published in the West don't, unfortunately, um, you're looking at upwards of 4 million people. About 10,000 armored fighting vehicles, that's tanks, self-propelled guns, self-propelled howitzers, yeah. assault guns, studs, the whole nine yards. Something like 5,000 aircraft and 15,000 guns. To put that into some kind of quick perspective, yeah, um, that's three times the size of Normandy. Mm -hmm. uh, two times the size of battles like Berlin, Stalingrad, um, Verdun, and mm -hmm. uh, the Somme. Twelve times the size of the Battle of El Alamein. Twenty times the size of the Battle of Waterloo. And forty times the size of Operation Market Garden. Oh, holy hell. So, uh, yeah, it's definitely a big one. We're, we're talking like 40k skill skirmish. Uh... We're going to need a bigger <laughs> boat. <laughs> so, Trust the Russian so, front to generate so, such a big fight, though. So I can, I can, I can now understand why we're looking at this. Not yeah. only because of the significance of it being so huge, but why we're looking at it from a gaming perspective. Jim, where do you start in trying to explore something that's just as massive as that? Okay, well. Uh, you start by writing a five-part article series about it. Uh, I'm just um, well played. So uh, when we're putting together you know, this article series, uh, I, I sat down and I started writing, and I'm like, you know, sometimes there's too much history and not enough gaming in it, and you know, but this time that that, that wasn't really a problem because the, the battle is just so huge yeah. that there's no way to even scratch the history. So you have to yeah. go straight into gaming. Um, so to answer your question. Uh, from an, an oblique angle, perhaps yeah. a little bit. Uh, we're going to be doing gaming um, from a number of different levels in Kursk. Uh, so remember way back when we did the four levels of wargaming. In the Kursk article series, we're going to be doing wargaming from at least three of those levels, starting off briefly with uh, operational level gaming. This is where each one of your pieces is perhaps a division, yeah. a regiment in size. Uh, your, your hexes are several miles across. Um, down to command tactical, unit-based tactical gaming, mm -hmm. and then all the way down into uh, your standard, typical uh, miniature tabletop uh, gaming. Yeah, uh, we're trying to give some people just a little bit of background on you know Kursk, obviously, but also maybe some inspiration to try the Eastern Front in general. Yeah, uh, this is why I was so so happy when you guys started to work on your Eighth Guards Army back in the day. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're doing, if you're going to call yourself a World War II war gamer, mm -hmm. you should at least try or look into doing the Eastern Front to a certain extent. Yeah, and we've had this conversation before with Justin and John during the Barbarossa series. You can actually sit down and crunch the numbers and do the math. 85% of World War II takes place in the East. Mm -hmm. If you're going to read about, know about, war game a little bit about um, World War II, you really need to take a look at the Eastern Front. That yeah. Yeah. So um, the, if we do a, a, a bit of a summary of, um, of where you're, you're going to lead us over these five parts, Jim, um, what's, well, what's the route we're taking? Okay, so uh, like like an outline of the article series. Yeah, yeah. So for the, it, okay, well, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, so it was like um, it, so we uh, well to put it into perspective, we have the 75th anniversary is coming up. Okay, um, uh, this is kind of like the sequel to Stalingrad, is it? Okay, yeah. Uh, so if we're looking at like the background of how Curse gets started, yeah, uh, which we go, we're kind of briefly in part one, but the background of Curse 
very, very, very quickly. It kind of yeah. goes like this. Uh, so the Germans invade the Soviet Union uh, as part of Operation Barbarossa in June of 1941. Mm -hmm. uh, they do amazingly well. They can score some of the largest, and again, you can measure it by just the number of people. The largest battles and some, or some of the largest victories, um, so I'm speaking about Kiev in particular, some of the largest victories in the history of ever. Yeah. Uh, just collapsed. How the Red Army didn't just collapse, it did collapse. It collapsed, it was rebuilt, collapsed again, it was rebuilt uh, several times over. This leads to Typhoon, Operation Typhoon, in October of 41, where the Germans start to get slowed down. And then finally, the Soviet counterattacks in the front of Moscow in December of 41. The Germans actually get kicked in the teeth a little bit. Yeah. This is important because this sets up a bit of a pattern that leads into Kursk, which is what the Soviets, Soviet soldiers actually used to call the winter German versus the summer German. We can always beat them in the winter. They're not that tough in the winter. But yeah. in the summer, they are a monster. No matter what weapons we have, no matter what generals we have, no matter how brave we are, we always lose. They're always behind us. Yeah. They're always on the flanks. How do these summer Germans always defeat us? It comes around in 1942. The Germans hoped to knock out the Soviet Union in the first year of the war. Didn't happen. This leads into the second year. We'll get them the next time around. This leads to the case blue, their next big operation, in uh, the summer of 42. This sets up a second big pattern that leads into Kursk. Whereas in the first year of the war, the Germans hit the entirety of the Soviet Union uh, from you know, the White Sea to the Black Sea. Let's get the whole show going. In 1942, the Soviets are a little stronger. The Germans are a lot weaker. They have to focus mostly in the center, but really down in the south. This is Case Blue, yeah. which leads to Stalingrad. So we have Stalingrad, and we all know what kind of happened at Stalingrad. Uh, the Germans get kind of cut off, surrounded, this opens up a big gash in their line, and uh, it's a huge defeat for the Germans. Mm -hmm. uh, so do we have that map available that we can bring up? Yep, or? we have the map right here, yep. Okay, cool. So if that map is up on the screen, and if you guys can, can kind of see what I'm looking at, you see Stalingrad over there to the east. Yep. You see these two big red Soviet arrows kind of pinching in from the north and the south. Mm -hmm. uh, this encapsulates, everyone knows that the 6th Army was in Stalingrad. Also, about half of 4th Panzer Army is in that same pocket. Somehow that always gets left out. Yeah. So it's even worse than most people say it is. Mm -hmm. So if you, if, if you can kind of picture like the German line as like a series of units, and then those two arrows kind of close in around it and, yeah. and seal off that pocket, what you've got is not just 6th Army and half of 4th Panzer Army is gone. You've got this hole in the German line now that's hundreds of miles wide. Yeah. Stalingrad, as bad as it was, should have, would have, could have been literally ten times worse. Yeah. Because this is the first stage of what Zhukov is really trying to do. Mm -hmm. He closes in this pocket, he opens up this huge gash, and now what he's looking at, what he's trying to do, is to launch this gigantic right hook from where that pocket has closed off down to the south, the southwest, to catch, uh, to, to reach the Sea of Azov, to reach the Black Sea. Yeah. And this cuts off everything that you see further down to the southeast, down into the Donbass, down into uh, the Caucasus, down towards the Caspian Sea. So the 6th Army is already gone. Fourth of, uh, fourth Panzer, half of 4th Panzer Army is already gone. The Germans are, all, are probably going to lose if this plan comes to full fruition. Mm -hmm. If this plan really comes to full fruition, 17th Army is gone. The rest of the 4th Panzer Army is gone. All of Von Kleist's 1st Panzer Army is gone. Everything that's down there in the Caucasus is gone. You're talking about half of the, the entire southern German wing. You're talking about half of their striking power and 40% of their divisions. 100 German divisions are wiped off the order of battle oh. if this works. Mm -hmm. World War II ends in 1944 with a completely Soviet-dominated Central Europe. Yeah. You don't have a, a East and West Germany, you have an East and West France. Yeah. The Berlin is in Paris somewhere. This doesn't happen because of one man, sort of, uh, Field Marshal Eric von Manstein. Uh -huh. is, uh, we've talked about him before. Uh, this is, you know, obviously, you ask you know, people who know, um, top five German generals, top five anyone's generals. Rommel never makes the list. It's always guys like von Manstein. Yeah. The invasion of France, 1940, was his idea, and he invented the Stug. 
So, oh, my hero! <laughs> Your brother. My hero. Right, I'm glad you enjoyed the show. Um, <laughs> so as the Soviets are pouring through, through this gigantic gap, Manstein, it's a read, it's all be. Believe it or not, Hitler is kind of sat down and kind of sucking his thumb a little bit. He he never re- admits this publicly, but he realizes Stalingrad was kind of his fault. Yeah, he's not for a brief window of time. The German generals actually have a little bit of uh, a little bit of, of operational freedom, and Manstein is like a judo fighter. It's probably the best example I can come up with. Yeah, he's super mobile. He's on he's on like the balls of his feet, and as the Soviets are coming at him. Like, like in judo, you almost like if someone throws a punch at you, you grab the wrist and you kind of use the enemy's momentum against them. You yes. throw them into a bit of hip toss. He's using this. So he's doing this with divisions. He's doing this with hundreds of thousands of men. Yeah. And he's using the Soviet momentum against them. He. It's. I think the historian David Dowding. I think that was. I'll have to look that up to get the exact quote. But the the, the quote is to find a better example or to find an equal example of mobile defensive warfare. You have to go back to General Lee in the wilderness, 1864. Right. The American War. He is ab- he's absolutely on fire. Yeah. He's out for 10 to 1, and somehow he doesn't win, but he slows the Soviets down. Yeah. This culminates in what they call Manstein's backhand blow. Mm-hmm. It's this masterpiece of a counterattack. He takes Kharkov. Kharkov's changed hands within a month, twice already, uh, more than the entire war, but just now in February and March of 1943. Um, excuse me. Uh, so this huge shelf of Soviet advance from uh, east to west, you can see with those little, those super simplified gray arrows on that map there, that he has knocked down the, the center of it, and he's knocked down the southern part of it. This whole long-winded, convoluted conversation gets to the point where there's one big piece of this Soviet gained territory, Soviet liberated territory that Manstein was not able to take back, was not able to slow down very much. This leads into this this big slice of ground that's left is to the north, and that is centered around the Soviet city of Kursk. Kursk, yes. Okay, yeah. So that that so, has set the scene then. Um, it generally set. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so that set the scene. So we've got this classic case of uh, an unstoppable force versus an immovable object then. Yeah, so right after Manstein's backhand blow, uh, what they call the Rasputida sets in, is what the Soviets called it. And it's basically the rain. Yeah. The Eastern Front has this reputation that it's really mobile in the winter and it's really mobile in the summer and really mobile, and that's it. And everything has to stop during the winter. During the winter, it was very mobile because the ground was frozen and the ground was hard. Where the Eastern Front really stops and has to take a break, it's during the fall and during the spring. Yeah. So that's when the rains come and everything turns into mud. Mm-hmm. So after all this, the dust starts to settle, after Stalingrad, during the spring rainy season, the Germans are looking at the map. They're saying, I can't believe what just happened at Stalingrad, and I can't believe we actually sort of survived. That was incredible. Okay, what are we going to do for the summer of 43? These previous um, patterns I was talking about, where it was, okay, the Soviets have... The Germans hit the Soviets with everything they had across the entire front in 41. They can only hit a small part in 42. And now in 43, they have to pick a certain point. Yeah. And they look around at the map, and they have like the perfect. They have the perfect target. They have the screws sailing. A little bit too perfect. Mm-hmm. The Soviets are. I'm not going to get into all the espionage of it, but there's Soviets have plenty of warning. The target is super obvious. When you have this gigantic bulge, um, that extends out of your territory into the enemy's territory. It's called a salient in military terms. Yeah. Um, these are the most dangerous places on any battlefield for both sides. Yeah. Number one, they're springboards for an attack because you're already deep into the enemy's territory. But number two, they're very, very vulnerable because they can get attacked from the sides. Yes. And pushed off. And this is what the Germans were trying to do. The Germans took several months between March and July of 43 to build up absolutely everything they could mm-hmm. to put into this one monster attack. Um, they called it the Kesselschlag. They wanted, they wanted another cauldron battle. So, in 1941, they hit the Soviet Union with 3 million men, 3,000 tanks, and about 2,000 aircraft. Now, in 1943, they're going to hit about 1 million men, 
250, I'm sorry, 2,500 tanks and self-propelled guns, about 2,000 aircraft. So maybe like half that size of that army equals that size of the army in certain terms or whatever. But it, it, just to give comparison yeah. to what happened in 1941. Except here, they're not attacking the entire Soviet Union with that. They're attacking the Kursk salient, which, yeah. by the way, is almost exactly the size of Northern Ireland. <laughs> that's there us. That's, yeah, that size there. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's put a, it into perspective for yeah, you. Uh, that is our country. Yeah. That, that's yeah. salient. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Take, it does look take like... Northern Ireland off the map, turn it on its side, yeah. you put it in the middle of southern Russia, that's the Kursili, about 110 yeah. miles north to south, uh -huh. about 75 yeah. miles deep. Germany's going to hit that with about half of what they hit all of Russia, all the Soviet Union with two years ago. Oh my god. Give you an idea of how, yeah. how yeah. dead this battlefield's going to be. Like I said, the Soviets are warned by the Lucy spy ring and the OK age. They have spies with an ultra, ultra warns them right out of Bachelor Bachelor Park. Plus the target super obvious. They have months to prepare. They see this coming and they prepare accordingly. Yeah. So, yeah, as far as unstoppable force versus a movable object, I, that's that's a really good way to put it. I think as well, the Soviet, if, oh, sorry, if, I, if I can just quickly interject as well. Yeah. The fact that the salient's there, that's mm -hmm. not just guys standing around doing nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure, Jim, as you'll probably uh, bounce off me very soon on it, the amount of defences that were sent up, mm. set up in the salient were unreal. Yeah. The front line unreal, was... Yeah. The, the front line was something like five kilometres deep. <sighs> Wait, yeah, so... The, the, of stuff. Line. Yeah. So, like, the, the, the most front line of defences in the salient yeah. was, like, five kilometres deep. Yeah. And that was anti-tank guns, minefields, tanks, everything. That was just a big wall of steel and trenches. And then behind that was another big wall of steel and trenches. And then behind that, another one. Yeah, for five <laughs> this, dollars. This extended Mine. from, let's let's say, here to Balaminas, what, 25 miles? Yeah. 30 yeah. miles? A lot that, was that? That's, yeah. In and around this? Or yeah. like a straight line across it? Or no, what? all through it. Layered lines. Mm. All uh, the way through it. So from here to Balamina would have been nothing but... Minefields, guns, men, tanks, artillery, everything, just all of that just bunched up yeah. to, to wait for the Germans to turn up. It sounds like the last place you'd want to attack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if you think, if they have all that power the there... He quoted, he's, he's quoted in, in at least two books by Manshine and Guderian, where he sets his plan up and they're going to do it. And then in June, Hitler starts to talk about it some more and more. And then finally Hitler's just like, I don't want to talk about it anymore. They called it Operation Citadel by that point. Yeah. I don't want to talk about Operation Citadel. The entire idea makes my stomach turn. Yeah. yeah. The Germans knew this was going to be an absolute an absolute mess. Uh, but by then, they didn't really have a choice. So the Soviets had to capitalize on Stalingrad. The Germans were never going to hand them another victory like that. Yeah. And they had to win now. They had to beat that summer German. Mm -hmm. Could they beat the summer German? That was not the point of that earlier segue. Uh, the Germans, on the other hand, um, we're already losing the war. There's the smart people. We're talking about the summer of 43 by this Yeah. Um, the Americans are in. The Battle of El Alamein has already taken place. They're losing in North Africa. Normandy's only you know, a matter of time. They, they have to win somewhere. They have to score some kind of massive success in order to maintain any kind of control yeah. over, uh, over any kind of strategic you know, picture or to get mm -hmm. anything out of this war. Um, this was the victory the Germans had to have. So both sides knew this fight was coming. Both sides had months to prepare. Mm -hmm. uh, both sides needed this win. Yeah. And holy hell were they prepared to pay for it. We're talking yeah. about Stalinist Russia and Nazi Germany. Yeah. The phrase human life doesn't even enter into their vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Okay. So all of this sets up a battle, the likes of which the human race has simply never seen. And God willing, we'll never see you again. Yeah. Um. Uh, so, what game systems are we going to look at, Jim? <laughs> I, I don't know how you segue from something like that, man. You know, it's like, <laughs> well, you know, it's horrible, but we're going to game it anyway. <laughs> the human race would never survive another battle like this. If you're going to yeah. have another battle like this, battles take place within wars, and if yeah. you're going to have a battle the size of Curse. That means that the war has to be a little bit bigger than that. By the time you have a war that size with today's weapons, if anyone's writing that article series, they're going to paint it on the side of a cave somewhere. Yeah. Just mm -hmm. walking away from that one. Yep. So to, to game it, like I said, we talk about the we talk about the operational scale a little bit, like 
here's the entire Battle of Curse. Your map is 110 miles wide or whatever. A little bit longer because you've got the Kharkov, the Belgorod Shelf in the south, and you've got the Orel salient in the north. So your map's like 200 miles uh, tall and maybe 150 miles across when you set up these successive belts that John's talking about. Yeah. And you, you're the German player and you try to smash in there. Are there other plans? Like Justin was saying, this sounds like the worst place you'd ever want to attack. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, Herr General, let's see your friggin' plan. You know, yeah. <laughs> but it's it, the it, level of gaming that you have to be at if you're going to. Well, maybe if they had gone straight through the center or if they had attacked everything in the south or everything in the north, they have some kind of different plan. This is the kind of war gaming that you have to do if you really want to explore those kind of options. We talk about that a little bit. For, ta for large scale tactical, uh, this is going to be very predictable at this point, almost as predictable as the German attack on, at Citadel. Is uh, the name of the game is literally Battle Group Kursk. Uh -huh. uh, that was their that was their first big uh, um, supplement for Battle Group. Uh, yeah. They won one of the awards in the Beast of War uh, Game of the Year, Historical Game of the Year in 2014. Yeah. We're going to use Battle Group Kursk, although we're going to use it in 15 millimeter. However, we do spend a lot of time also talking about Flames of War. Yeah. And the reason I want to talk about Flames of War for uh, for Kursk as well is. Flames of War um, has certain strengths, and every game has certain strengths. And it, it, for a battle like Kursk, Flames of War's strengths really play to what you're trying to do. You're talking yeah. about very large battles. You're talking about a lot of tanks in the battle. It sounds like a great system for Flames of War. And it's yeah. Yeah. However, that said, people have this idea that Kursk was a tank battle. Mm -hmm. It wasn't. 90, like most battles, 90% of it is with infantry. Yeah. And the belts that John was talking about before, what these belts are anchored on are these hundreds of little tiny villages and state farms and little railroad junctions, like a place called Provko. Hold on, we're not there yet. Mm -hmm. um, these tiny little these hamlets and towns and state farms or whatever, the Soviets fortify the heck out of these things, dig these anti-tank pits, dig these trenches, lay in something like four million mines in all around about oh, the size of Ireland. Wow. Actually. So you've got these um, little fortified strong points, these little towns, these little state farms that are held by Soviet guards infantry, especially in the south. Yeah. They have to get attacked by SS grenadiers, uh, divisions like Gross Deutschland, Panzer Grenadiers, uh, German assault uh, pioneers, it's basically their armored assault infantry. You've got these savage little uh, infantry battles with elite infantry on both sides, or at least very, very veteran infantry on both sides, um, in these little built-up areas, a lot of woods, believe it or not, a lot of these small towns and state farms. These are games that are perfect, I feel, for systems like Chain of Command and Bolt Action. Yeah, these are your yeah. big 28 millimeter infantry-heavy games. Mm -hmm. um, don't let the fact that Kursk has this has this reputation of this gigantic tank battle step, it's part big part of that, but there's also this huge dimension of attacking infantry in prepared positions, uh, anti-tank guns, and that's where you get into these infantry heavy um, yeah. games like bolt action and command. Yeah. It sounds awesome. It sounds the, absolutely the, awesome. The, if I, if I remember right, Jim, the tank battle at Kursk was a complete accident, wasn't it? Well, when we get to talk about Prokhorovka. Yep. yep. Um, it, it, nobody was planning on it, that's for sure. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so um, can you describe to me what the features of Kursk, the, the features of the Battle of Kursk are then? Or, you know, it's... Well, yeah, we, we've touched on it a little bit. Uh, first off, it's just the gigantic size of the battle. Yeah. Uh, three German armies versus three Soviet fronts. And that's in the first phase. Yeah. That's not even like the main. We'll get into that in a second. Um, the Soviet defenses, John was absolutely right. These are the, de the thickest defenses ever built. Um, you've got tons of new equipment. This is what everyone really likes about Kursk. Yeah. Is, this is Christmas morning and Santa, everyone's been a very good boy this year. Yeah. Everyone gets brand new toys under the mm -hmm. tree. You've got the Panther, which didn't work. You've got the Ferdinand Elephant, which didn't work. <laughs> you've got the Brumbar, uh, the, the Grizzly Bear, roughly translated, uh, very roughly translated. Um, the Nash Horn, um, the, the Germans have these uh, remote-controlled mine, mine tanks. Yeah, they're cute. Like, these remote, not, not the Goliaths, everyone's kind of familiar with. These are these, these almost, they almost look like old Mark 1s. Uh -huh. you, you, you drive them out there by remote control, um, 
and then it would like leave off these explosives. Then you try to drive the tank back, mm-hmm. and then the explosives would go off and set off all the mines. Um, you have the HS one attack. Uh, are we still there? Yeah, yeah, yeah we're still yeah, here, yeah. Jim. Yep. Um, the HS one twenty nine ground attack aircraft. This was the German A ten or the German attempt at an A ten. Yeah. Um, you have the uh, Ju eighty seven G. This is the new Stuka that kind of gives up on the bombs, believe it or not. Yeah. And instead, they install these big 37-millimeter uh, uh, autocannon pods under the wings. Yeah. They turn it into a, a straight-out tank buster. Mm. This is where you have Hans Rudel, the, 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 yeah, the Stuka ace. He gets, like, I don't remember how many T-34 kills. Uh, yeah, with it's, this a, it's over 100. Really? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's well it's, over it's the 100. Huge. Yeah. That's mad. You have the ISU-152 assault gun. This oh. is my version of the Stuka. Yeah, <laughs> this going to be bigger and better. This thing is and you can't break it. Horror show. Yeah, ask John about what the ISU 152 is. Uh, this is this is what the Stug fantasizes about. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, when the Stug goes to bed and looks up, he's got a little poster of a uh, ISU uh, yeah, 152. ISU 152 <laughs> I yep. could be like that one day. <laughs> uh, the Soviets called this thing the Animal Killer. Because yeah. this was the point of the war where the Germans were naming everything after an animal. Yeah. We got the tiger, we got the panther, we got the grizzly bear, the gnash horn, the elephant, the lions and tigers and bears, oh my, the Soviets don't care. Yeah. You got an animal, we can kill it dead uh-huh. with this thing. And you try it on the, uh, you, you try it in miniature and, and, and you'll, still, you'll definitely see what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, the Soviets' uh, defenses that John was talking about, um, this interconnected web that are built into these general bands, and then behind that is another band, and behind that is another band, and so on and so forth. The German attack gets stalled in these, and then you have these massive uh, Soviet tank counterattacks. Mm-hmm. It starts off with 2nd Tank Army in the north. It starts off with uh, my favorite Soviet general, uh, Mikhail Efimovich Kalikov's 1st Tank Army, later 1st Guards Tank Army, uh, and counterattacking in the south. And eventually they have to send in the 5th Guards Tank Army versus 2nd SS Panzer Corps. This is the Battle of Prokhorovka that is not so much the climax, but definitely the high point uh, yeah. of, of, the, of the Battle of Kursk. And this is only the halftime show. Yeah. As far as like wrapping up like the features of Kursk, most Western histories point at, Kur- point at Prokhorovka and they say, oh, the Germans lost the Prokhorovka, and that's, you know, the end of the Battle of Kursk. Mm. First of all, the Germans didn't really lose in Prokhorovka, and secondly, it did not end the Battle of Kursk. Yeah. This is the halftime show. Uh-huh. This is when the, the Germans have thrown absolutely everything that their nation and empire could possibly throw at the Soviets. They have the largest battle mankind has ever seen, and they come up short. Oh. That's not the end of the battle. That's when yeah. Zhukov picks up a handful of dice leans across the table and with a smile most unpleasant says that was a good try now it's my turn oh. <laughs> and you get into operations kutuzov and rumyatsev and it's the battle of course phase two and uh, that's actually even a little bit bigger oh. so jim five parts we're, we're we're looking forward to it starts on july 2nd okay so yep. monday july 2nd it starts um uh, do you want to give us a quick overview of, of each of the five parts uh, yeah, super fast, because um, I don't want to chew up all the time here. So part one is, like I said, the background, uh, the, the general uh, Soviet and, and German plans and how that was going to work, and the different gaming systems from operational all the way down to tactical. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Part two is we do the assault from the north. This is Admiral Vol- or, I'm sorry, Admiral. Holy crap, Wait, where's my coffee? <laughs> this is uh, <laughs> Colonel General Walther Modell. Um, this some some uh, war gamers might know him, or you might if you've ever seen the movie uh, uh, of A uh, Bridge Too Far. This is the big German commander. He he would be the German commander during Operation Market. Yeah. Um, he's got the Ninth Army in the north. So if we remember, the the salient comes down like this big bulge extending to the west. The Germans are hitting this primarily from the north and the south. They want to meet at Kursk and pinch off this big Soviet pocket. So in part two, we talk about the attack from the north. Mm-hmm. That's when you see your elephants, your, your, your grizzly bears, and uh, you have this gigantic battle that takes place in the north. In part three, we do the same thing in the south. This is Manstein's Army Group South, uh, Hoth's 4th uh, Panzer Army, and Army Detachment Kempf, hitting 7th Guards, 1st Guards Tank Army, and eventually 5th Guards Tank Army. This even larger battle to the south, and that's where you get to Prokhorovka. 
Prokhorovka we, we handle specifically in part four. Mm. Uh, the name of the article is actually The Myth of Prokhorovka. Yeah. Uh, just we, we want to set the record straight on a few things. Yeah. Because it is the largest tank battle. This is the part where you were actually correct. Before. This is the Prokhorovka is the largest tank battle that probably the one there will ever there will ever be. Yeah. Um, uh, John was right. It definitely isn't some, wasn't really part of anyone's plan. It was in fact the Soviets had having to change their plan in a, a, a bit of a flurry. Uh, it didn't. It wasn't supposed to happen the way it was, but it did. It's not as big as people say it was, but it's still the biggest. Yeah. And uh, it wasn't really a German victory, but it did kind of stop their final advance to Operation Citadel. We, we go over all this in part five. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in part five, uh, we have Zhukov's counter-strike. Again, Prokhorovka didn't end Kursk, uh, and certainly, this is where you get the real stuff that you want to laugh at. Uh, certainly, it wasn't the Allied landings in Sicily. Yeah. Because while Kursk is happening, and during the exact, like, I think it was July 10th, uh, right as Prokhorovka is just about to get started, that's actually July 12th, uh, you have the Americans and the British landing in Sicily. And Hitler kind of gets spooked, and he says, okay, we got to start pulling some divisions out of Russia to defend uh, Italy and Sicily in the south. And some people will say that that kind of helped end the Battle of Kursk. Well, first of all, the Battle of Kursk doesn't end until the middle of August. Yeah. And number two, those divisions that supposedly got pulled out of Russia to fight in Sicily never made it out of Russia. Because right. as soon as they get back to the trailheads, those previously mentioned Soviet offensives get started. They say, okay, never mind Sicily, the hell of them. They're on their own. Turn back around. You're going back to uh, the bad side of old mother Russia. That's right. You guys, there you have it. It kicks off on um, uh, July 2nd. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, we're a, fi- a massive five part series looking at the gaming of the Battle of Kursk. Jim. It'd be great to get you back on the show, maybe maybe around the halfway point of the uh, of the series, just to 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 go, to look at what has, has what it have been written at that point, maybe in a little more detail and learn a little bit more about it. So, but uh, this is fantastic, Jim. Thank you very much for coming on and telling us all about it, mate. And Absolutely. yeah, we were we we're going to get ready for. Well, I was thinking for tank battles, but this is like everything yeah. is going into this. There, there, this there is an tank battles. Battle. <laughs> awesome. Right, we'll be right back. After this.